Hey everyone, Reflected here. To complete my Warbird tutorial series, and with a massive update coming to my Blue Nose Bastards campaign, I thought I'd make an ultimate P51 tutorial that covers everything you need to know in order to survive this campaign. Today, I'm going to show you how to fly the DCS P51D Mustang by the book using real life procedures, following the pilot's handbook. If you've seen any of my Warbird tutorials, you know that I'm not a huge fan of quick and dirty 6 to second tutorials. I like to deep dive into the systems, understand why each step is required, and I even do checks and tests that are not really needed in a flight sim. So if you just clicked on this video to get into the air quickly, then look for another tutorial. If you'd like to understand how the P-51 was flown in World War II, then this video is for you. In my Blue Nose Bastards campaign, you fly the Mustang in historically accurate, realistic scenarios, so quick and dirty is not gonna cut it. By the way, this is a sneak peek into the working progress version of the new Normandy 2 map, with the permission of Uger Media. Again, emphasis on work in progress. Anything may still be subject to change. So, here we are in the cockpit of the iconic P-51D Mustang. First, you need to make sure you have zero hydraulic pressure. It should be released every time after shutting down the engine, otherwise the landing gear may be accidentally raised as you or your crew chief moves around in the cockpit. Also, verify the gear handle is in the down position. You don't want any surprises when the hydraulic pressure comes on. If all is good, set the parking brake by pulling the handle, depressing the pedals, then releasing the pedals and releasing the handle. If you did it right, the handle will stay in the out position. Then, make sure the controls are unlocked. Check for full and unrestricted movement. Check your fuel. The Mustang has three internal tanks, one 92-gallon tank in each wing, and one 85-gallon tank inside the fuselage behind the pilot. The wing tanks should be full. The gauges are on either side of the seat on the floor. The fuselage tank's gauge is behind your seat on the left side. Check how much fuel is in there. It will be very important later on. I know many people fly with the fuselage tank empty, but that's not very realistic and it's never going to happen in my campaigns. Now let's sweep from left to right to get everything ready for startup. On the left side, we raise the flaps. Note that they won't move because we don't have any hydraulic pressure yet. Carburetor air control forward to the ram position. I assume you would leave this in the aft filtered position if you operate from a dusty airstrip, say in North Africa and then you would set it to ram once you're clear of the ground. Move the carb heat lever forward as well to the normal position. Then set the trim. Aileron neutral. Rudder 5 degrees right. And the elevator? As required. Because our Mustang has metal elevators, the manual recommends setting it to 2 degrees nose heavy if the fuselage tank is full, but you're not carrying wing tanks or bombs and 4 degrees nose heavy if you are. If we had fabric covered elevators, you need nose up trim, but I think 99% of the DCS players have non-force feedback sticks that are centered by a spring and not the actual aerodynamic forces. Therefore, the recommended settings may not work for you. You need to experiment and find a trim setting that works with your stick so that the plane flies off the ground nicely. You don't have to pull too hard to rotate, but it doesn't want to pull up sharply either. My sweet spot is at zero, but that's just my setup. Now comes a step that is not in the pilot's handbook, but I've seen many pilots who fly restored P-51s do this to preserve the longevity of the battery. I imagine you would have done it in World War II as well if you had a personal aircraft and you wanted to take good care of it. So. When these covers are closed, the coolant radiator and oil cooler flap switches are up in the auto position. 
opened and closed automatically by a thermostat. But as soon as the electrical power comes on, they will start to move, draining the battery with no added value. So we open the covers and move them to the manual position to make sure they don't move when we turn on the battery. Mixture, idle cutoff. Throttle, check for full and unrestricted movement, then set it to one inch open. Propeller control, check the movement and set it fully forward to max RPM. Verify your supercharger is set to auto and the cover is closed. Set your altimeter. Set it to zero feet if you just want to fly around the airfield locally and set it to the local Q&H if you fly proper mission. When over Berlin, knowing your altitude above your home field has zero added value. You want to know your altitude above sea level. Set the pressure in this little window. It should be in your briefing and then verify the altimeter shows the airfield's elevation. Uncage your gyro horizon. Verify that your armament switches are off. Turn on the fuel shutoff valve and select the left fuel tank. The vapor return line from the carburetor is feeding back into the left tank so you want to burn some fuel and make space for the return otherwise you'll just be pissing fuel over the side. Adjust the cockpit lighting as desired. Also, verify that you have 400 psi of oxygen pressure. By default, the oxygen regulator is set to auto. You don't need to touch it. Do not turn this red knob. It's just a bypass and that's only for emergencies because it depletes your supplies rather quickly. Now you can turn on the battery and the generator. All right, it's time to start the engine. Turn on the fuel booster pump and verify that the fuel pressure rises to eight to 12 pounds. Prime the engine by holding the primer switch up. The Mustang's engine can easily be over primed. You need one second if the engine is warm, three, four seconds if it's cold. One, two, three, Four. Now the actual starting. Open the starter cover, press and hold the starter, and let the propeller rotate a few blades to get the engine's lubrication flowing before the engine catches. Then flip the magnetos to both, and when the engine catches, move the mixture control to the run position, which is the same as auto rich. Make sure you don't move it all the way forward to emergency reach, otherwise you'll have problems later. All right, here we go. Clear prop. Starter on, mags on, engine catches, make sure to run, release the starter. Stabilize the RPM at 1200 and check the oil pressure rises to at least 50 PSI within 30 seconds. If not, shut down the engine immediately. Also, check that the hydraulic pressure builds up and the flaps are moving up. Now that the generator is running, you can turn on the radio. Select the channel that's assigned to your local airfield. Turn on the pitot heat and the gun heat. And now we wait for the engine to warm up. The higher the power, the faster it warms up, but the oil pressure also rises. Only apply so much power so that the oil pressure doesn't go too far above the red line at 90 PSI. In case of an emergency takeoff, you can accelerate this process by applying oil dilution for two minutes maximum. And that decreases the oil pressure, allowing you to add more power but normally, you would just idle at 1200 to 1300 RPM and let the engine warm up. You need at least about 40 degrees of oil temperature before you should taxi. But while the engine warms up, we have a lot of stuff to check and keep us busy. First, you verify that the coolant and oil cooler flaps work as intended. 
move the switches forward and aft to open and close them. Listen to the electric whirring sound because you can't see the flaps from the cockpit. Some pilots flip the covers back and move the switches to auto from here on. The generator is running, we are not draining the battery anymore. But what if the thermostat fails? So to be safe, you can manually open them fully while you're on the ground. It's your call. You'll know they're fully open when the whirring sound stops. Lower the flaps incrementally, then raise them to make sure they operate properly. 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, and up. Press the landing gear unsafe warning lamp to make sure it works. When the gear is down but not locked, a red light comes on to warn you and you want to make sure it's off because there's no problem, not because you have a broken bulb. Then we turn off the fuel booster pump to verify the engine driven pump is working and can keep the fuel pressure up on its own. Don't forget to turn it back on. Run the engine on each tank for at least half a minute to make sure they all feed properly. Okay, we have good temps, time to taxi. Release the parking brake by pressing both brake pedals. Taxiing is pretty easy in the Mustang because the wheels are wide apart. Also, when the stick is neutral or held slightly aft, the tail wheel is locked and it's steerable 6 degrees in either direction with the rudder pedals. If you push the stick forward, the tail wheel becomes full swiveling, like on the Spitfire for example. You'll need this if you want to turn sharply using differential braking. Be careful to always unlock the tail wheel first and only then start a sharp turn, otherwise it tends to bind. Also when making a sharp turn, make sure the inside wheel is still rolling forward. Don't let the tire twist on the ground in one place. Most of the time, just keep the stick all the way back in your lap to keep the tail down and minimize the chances of the prop hitting the ground. The long nose obstructs forward visibility, so you'll need to make continuous S turns and look over the sides to make sure you don't hit anything, or anyone. It should be easy though with the tail wheel locked. The other problem is that fuel in World War II was heavily leaded. At low RPM, it tended to foul the spark plugs, so you'll need at least 1000 RPM while taxiing. This, however, may make you go too fast, so you'll constantly need to work the brakes to keep the speed in check. As you arrive at the hold short, it's time to perform some engine checks. Stop at an angle so that you don't blow your prop wash on the ship behind you. Check the mags. Run up to 2300 RPM and check the engine running on each mag. The maximum permissible drop is 100 RPM on the right mag and 130 on the left. If either drops more than that, it may be because you taxied with an RPM too low and the spark plugs got fouled. In this case, you can try to clear them at 30 inches of manifold for a minute. But if they still drop excessively after that, you need to return to the line and shut it down. Check the prop control. Move it all the way back and when you see a drop of 300 to 400 RPM on the tachometer, move it forward again. The engine should resume its former speed. Then we check the supercharger. Flip the cover and hold the switch in high. The lamp should come on and the drop of 50 RPM should be noted. We turn the switch to auto and close the cover. Okay, the engine is good. Throttle back to 1000 RPM. At this point you can choose to flip the coolant and oil cooler doors back to auto, but some pilots wait until they are airborne. Again, it's up to you. If you're not carrying any loads, you can take off with the flaps up, but if your Mustang is fully loaded and carries drop tanks or bombs, like in my campaign, you'll need 20 degrees of flaps. Close the canopy and take the runway. Always check and make sure nobody's landing, though. 
Stop on center line. Move forward to straighten the tail wheel and pull the stick back to lock it. Now for the takeoff. Here's what's going to happen. Hold the brakes. Stick in your lap. Open the throttle to 30 inches, then release the brakes. The aircraft starts to accelerate as you slowly but steadily open the throttle to 61 inches of manifold. If you're flying a lightly loaded Mustang, 52 inches may suffice to you. A typical mistake is to try and raise the tail too soon. As you move the stick forward, the tail wheel loses its steerability and you'll have trouble keeping it straight at low speeds. Make sure you have sufficient airflow over the rudder so the airspeed is alive around 50 to 60 miles per hour and even then raise the tail slowly. Raising the tail will also make the nose want to swing left so be prepared to counter it with right rudder. It's not as bad as say in a 109 though. Ideally try not to raise the tail fully off the ground so that the fuselage is horizontal. Try to keep the tail just a little bit up to let the wings bite and let the aircraft smoothly fly off the ground. I like to put the base of the gun sight on the horizon and keep it there. Also this will keep the prop clear of the ground. Okay here we go. Once airborne and you have a positive rate of climb, raise the gear to decrease drag and let the plane accelerate more quickly. Do not brake the wheels before retracting them. This may fuse the brake discs that are hot after the extended taxiing and then you'll nose over or ground loop on landing. Climb just enough to clear any obstacles but otherwise keep the nose down until you reach 165 miles per hour which is your best climb speed. Only then pull back on the stick just enough to maintain that speed. When all obstacles are cleared, raise the flaps and when you reach a safe altitude of 500 feet above ground level, decrease the power to 46 inches and 2700 RPM. Constantly adjust the trim as necessary. Also, flip the coolant and oil cooler doors back to auto if you haven't already. From here on, you just leave them in auto. That will give you optimal cooling with the least possible drag. Now about engine management. Military power is 61 inches of manifold and 3000 RPM. Use this in combat or for tactical climbs. Don't run the engine at this power setting for more than 15 minutes at a time. It's not like in some games where the stopwatch starts and at 15 minutes and 1 second your engine will die. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. These limits can be exceeded if the temperatures are in the green but they will reduce the lifetime of the engine. Your best climb speed is 165 miles per hour, but if the situation permits, try to set a higher speed, like 175 miles per hour, to get better cooling. Make sure you keep the ball centered with rudder or trim, otherwise you won't be able to keep up with the AI. If you need more power, you can move the throttle through the gate. There are some wires that stop the lever but if you push forward a bit harder, or in DCS you press a button, you break the wires and the throttle can be opened fully to 67 inches of war emergency power. The limit is 5 minutes, so only use it sparingly if you're really in trouble. It's not an official number, but if I want to climb fast but still go easier on the engine, I do it at 52 inches and 2850 RPM. 46 inches and 2700 RPM is your max continuous. The engine can run indefinitely at this setting. If you want to save fuel, cruise at 36 inches and 2400 RPM or you can go even lower. One thing is very important. Avoid using high manifold combined with low RPM, otherwise you'll overboost the engine. 
When you add power, increase RPM first, then the throttle. And when you decrease power, you move the throttle back first, then decrease RPM. As you climb into thinner and thinner air, you'll start to lose manifold pressure, so be prepared to further open the throttle. Remember, it's the manifold that counts, not the throttle position. At an altitude between 14,500 and 19,500 feet, the second gear of the supercharger will automatically kick in, depending on the amount of ram. It increases the blower to engine ratio from 6 to 1 to 8 to 1, giving you more available power at higher altitudes. You'll notice this by seeing the lamp come on and the power surge. Make sure you adjust the throttle accordingly. Now about fuel management. As I said before, you always start on the left tank to burn some fuel and make space for the carb overflow return line. As soon as you're airborne, however, you switch to the fuselage tank. See, if it has more than 40 gallons of fuel, the center of gravity is so far aft that absolutely no aerobatics are permitted. It's very easy to enter an accelerated stall like this. Treat your Mustang like a fully loaded B-17. When below 40 gallons, but over 25, the aircraft is still tail heavy, so use caution. The aim is to burn all but 25 gallons of fuel before you switch to any other tanks. So in case you meet the enemy, you can engage in air-to-air -air combat. With 25 gallons left in the fuselage tank, the aircraft is nicely balanced, and you should start using fuel from the other tanks. Use this last 25 gallons only as an emergency reserve. If you're carrying 75 gallon drop tanks under your wings, switch to one of them for 5 minutes, then to the other for 10 minutes, then back for 10 minutes, and so on. The idea is to keep the amount of fuel more or less the same on both sides in order to keep the aircraft balanced along the longitudinal axis. When they're empty, or you need to drop them, switch to the right wing tank, then alternate between the left and right every 10 minutes. We already burned some from the left tank, remember? Dropping the wing tanks is easy. Just switch the bomb selector to both, then press the bomb release button on top of your stick. Now let's see how to land this beast. First of all, you're a virtual fighter pilot. Forget about straight and landings, they're lame. Normally, flights of four came in low in echelon formation and peeled off over the field one by one, but now we're alone. As I said, World War II fuel was heavily leaded, you didn't really want to fly at lower than 15 inches of manifold to make sure the spark plugs don't get fouled. But you still need to slow down somehow, right? Therefore, you come in low over the field, of course, into the wind, not only to put on a show for the mechanics, but because you can break left or right and up and bleed your speed in the climb. Breaking the direction specified in the airfield's operation manual, or if it's not specified and there's a crosswind factor, break away from the wind so that your turn on final is into the wind. It's safer that way when you're low and slow. You can drop 10 to 20 degrees of flaps to help bleed your speed in the brake and then set the RPM to 2700, not 3000, because if you need to go around and slam the throttle, the governor won't be able to follow so quickly and you'll over -wrap the engine. The idea is to end up at 1000 feet above ground level, flying downwind parallel to the runway at a distance so that the wingtip just touches the runway. At 170 miles per hour, lower the gear and check for the green light. You'll need approximately 20 to 23 inches of manifold in the pattern and you keep slowing down by lowering the flaps incrementally. By the time you turn on final, you want full flaps. Some pilots set the rudder trim to 5 degrees right in case they need to apply power and go around. But some other Mustang pilots told me they keep it at zero to make the landing easier. P-51 goes around easily at 46 inches of manifold and at that power, keeping the aircraft straight with the rudder is easy, even with the trim centered. Again, your call. In World War II, they didn't fly rectangular patterns in Warbirds, because the long nose heavily obstructed visibility and you couldn't see the runway on final. 
Therefore, it was common practice to fly curved approaches, only straightening out over the threshold, thus keeping the touchdown point in sight at all times. When your wingtip touches the end of the runway, you begin your turn on final. You need to maintain around 120 miles per hour using the elevator. Too slow? Drop the nose. Too fast? Pull up a bit. Trim the elevator so that you don't have to fiddle with the stick. Stay on glide slope using the throttle. If you're too low, apply power. If you're high, throttle further back. But if your pattern is on the money, you'll barely need to touch the throttle. As you reach the runway, level your wings and smoothly break your descent. The idea is to end up just barely above the runway in a three-point attitude. P-51 stalls rather abruptly, so you don't want to be too high when this happens. So how do you know what a three-point attitude is? Easy. Before takeoff, check where the horizon intersects your canopy bars. Memorize that position. On landing, you pull the nose up to get that exact picture. You don't want your tailwheel to hit first and potentially be damaged, but if you're not in a fully three-point attitude, your tail slams down as your main wheels touch, rotating the nose up, increasing AOA, and thus lift, and you're airborne again. So if you bounce, it's because you touch down on your main wheels with the tail still up. To achieve a smooth landing, you keep the aircraft off the ground as if you didn't want to let it touch the runway. As it starts to settle, Pull back on the stick just a smidge, not too much, so as to let the ship climb, and then a little more until you achieve the three-point attitude. The closer the stall happens to the ground, the smoother your landing will be. World War II pilots nearly always run for three-pointer landings. If there's a strong crosswind, you can attempt a wheel landing, keeping the tail up. As you roll out, keep the stick in your lap to keep the prop from accidentally striking the ground, and this also gives you a steerable tailwheel. Try not to use the brakes too much, not while your speed is high anyways. Once at taxi speed, raise the flaps, move the propeller control fully forward, turn off the fuel booster pump, you won't need it anymore so let's go easy on it, open the canopy if you haven't already, and manually open the coolant and oil cooler flaps. You already know how to taxi the P-51. Once you reach your parking spot, lower the flaps fully. Set your trim tabs to the takeoff settings for next time, just in case you forget it. Turn off the radio, the pitot heat and the gun heat to make sure they don't drain the battery once the engine is not running anymore. Throttle up to 1500 RPM to clean the spark plugs, then move the mixture control lever to the cutoff position. After the propeller fully stopped, turn off the mags, then the battery and the generator. Turn off the fuel shutoff and release the hydraulic pressure by pulling out this red tab. It's important in order to prevent any accidental landing gear operations while parked. Someone kicks the lever while climbing out or something like this. Lock your controls by pulling out this red knob. There are two holes at the base of the stick and the spring-loaded rod will go through one of them. If you use the top hole, the tailwheel will be left free to swivel so the aircraft can be towed and moved around on the ground. Case the gyro horizon, undo the straps and climb out. Greet your crew chief and head to the debriefing to claim your two ME-109s destroyed and straight to the mass hall to shoot your watches with your squadron mates.
Alright, this is everything you need to know about flying the P-51D Mustang in realistic scenarios such as my Blue Nose Bastards campaign. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know if any of the information was incorrect or I said something stupid. I only fly gliders and motor gliders in real life I never flew in a real P-51 unfortunately. I hope you found this video helpful and managed to learn something new. Please don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss any future tutorials and campaign updates. See ya!